Assalamu alaikum, uh, ladies. Uh, again, we go back to English poetry. Today we have a new school, a new movement of uh, poetry spearheaded by, uh, by John Donne. Before we started videotaping this, I gave you an exercise. I asked you to compare between John Donne's poem, The Bait, and uh, Christopher Marlowe's The Passionate Shepherd to, uh, uh, to His Love. I'll be listening to, uh, to you probably if we don't have time today, we can do it next, uh, next class. But John Donne, if you look at the date when he was born and when he died, he was an Elizabethan figure. He was, he was a veteran. He lived in Elizabethan England. He was writing poetry when Shakespeare was writing uh, poetry. He was a contemporary of Shakespeare and those uh, Renaissance, uh, Renaissance figures. Why is John Donne different? Why isn't he considered to be a classical poet like those uh, uh, around him will see today and in the coming uh, classes? Today, before we comment uh, on Dan and his poetry and his uh, work, uh, today we start with a poem entitled The Bait. And you should be careful that most of these poems were not written with a title. Like many of the titles were given by critics let later on, but the bait is the food you use to catch fish. And I think even the title itself is a deviation from the norm, from the idealism of, of the Elizabethan England and the courtly love. We don't have a reference to the passionate shepherd or love or who so less to hunt or shall I compare thee to a summer's day. We have something slightly, uh, slightly different. When you start reading the poem, you're struck by the fact that you already know this line. You're familiar with it. It's verbatim, taken from somebody else. Come, live with me, and be my love. This is word for word. Plagiarism, theft, thank you very much. Intertextuality. Poets, writers, authors usually take from each other. Not to steal, not as academic theft, but this, this is some kind of imitation that is described as parody. This is one way poets interact with each other. This is one way poets pay our attention to something. This is, our, this is what some poets do in order to tell us, hey, look at that guy and look at me. Probably I'm doing the same thing. Probably I'm doing it differently. Probably I'm offering you a whole new world, a world view that is different. So the first line repeats verbatim what Marlowe said. Come live with me and be my love. And then we go to the second line with expectations. Is he going what? Is he, is this, is a, is this, is he a copycat? Is he, where is he taking us? And the second line says, and we will some new pleasures prove. Also, a word for word imitation of, of Marlowe, copying every word in Marlowe's second line and taking it word for word or not or not are they the same is he repeating the second line exactly as it is what what does Marlowe say Shaima what does Marlowe say all pleasures or all the pleasures so we have Marlowe here saying all, all, not just all, the pleasures, definite, all the pleasures. And we talked about how he's exaggerating, that's too much. This is, again, reflecting the idealism of the, uh, the, the Elizabethan uh, literature, Elizabethan poetry, how poets were assumed to be, you know, like kings, they can, they own everything, they have everything, they can offer everything. Depicting this idealistic uh, world, like a utopia they own. So this idealism is met here with something, something different. Instead of all, we have th this poet offering us some. only some. Thank you very much for using this term. So if this is idealistic, this is Realistic. This is a man who knows he doesn't have all. This is a person, a poet, 
who doesn't want to trick or deceive or exaggerate or to claim what he doesn't own, doesn't have. And he's saying, I'm just offering you some pleasures. Some pleasures. But these pleasures, he insists, the pleasures are, thank you very much. Now, and this newness <coughs> is key to John Donne. Many, I know many people, when they write about poetry or talk about uh, Dunn's poetry or write about Dun John Dunn's poetry, they just think that John Dunn is just a deviation, somebody who wrote different poetry at a particular time in history. He is a deviation, but that's just, it's not a fluke. It didn't, it didn't happen just because it happened. There is a conscious attempt. John Dunn knew very well what he was doing. He consciously, deliberately wrote against the mainstream uh, poetry writing of his time. He knows what he's doing. When he says, some, okay, maybe he wants to be different. But when he insists on, being, on, on, on offering new pleasures, I think this idea of newness goes like in opposite to uh, the fact that this is uh, uh, something opposing the old ways of writing poetry, of, of love, of courtly love, of poets offering all, trying to create this utopia perfect world to trick women, to fabricate stuff. John Donne is being realistic. He's being down to earth in many, in, many, in many ways. When you read the whole poem, you will also realize that this is different. We no longer have the pastoral sitting, the sheep and the shepherds and the shepherdesses and the, the, the birds, the natural elements and the trees and the valleys and the hills and the mountains, you know, and the gold and the silver and everything. We no longer have this. He takes us. He practices what he preaches. If he's saying, I'm offering you some new pleasures. The journey here is something different. He takes us. It is a very extended metaphor, sometimes we're more well known as a conceit. A conceit is a metaphor, it's a metaphysical metaphor that is long. And then the relationship between the, the vehicle and the turner is sometimes unlikely, far-fetched. You don't see what, what, how come you say you and I are like stiff twin compasses. And then the end of the argument, because there's the, this argument he's usually engaged in, it, it kind of makes sense. Now, the, the whole poem takes us into a different journey. No, there are no sheep, there are no shepherds, there are no birds singing and everything. The situation is totally different. This is a scene taken from fishing. A scene taken from, from fishing, somebody fishing. And I, I know some, there, are, there were some poets around uh, John Donne who were writing differently. Actually, few, not, not some. But to many, this is new. Because love, poetry, courtly love was basically written around, you know, the, the, in the bosom of nature. Basically, again, with sheep and trees and grass and everything. But this man is taking us to the river. So of golden sands and crystal <coughs> brooks with silken lines and silver hooks. You know the hook when you, when you fish? There will the river whispering run. And look at the whispering here, the personification of the river. Warmed by thy eyes. And this is an, another exaggeration. This is an Elizabethan thing to say. Warmed by thy eyes more than the sun. Yeah, more beautiful, more powerful. Ha, they have more warmth than the sun does. And there the enamored fish will stay, bigging themselves they may betray. The fish want to be caught. The fish want to be caught. And the fish bigging here is also another personification. When thou wilt swim in that live bath, each fish, which every channel hath, will amorously to thee swim, gladder to catch thee than thou him. The fish want to be caught and are happy that 
they're caught by you. Well, here the fish, uh, uh, like there are many people, like many people disagree what exactly John Donne is doing here. Is, uh, uh, is the woman the bait? What is the bait? Is the woman the bait or what is the bait here? But from the fact that he's saying that the, the, the amorous fish, the loving fish, want to be caught by you. So basically, it could mean that she is the, she is the bait. And the lovers running after her are the fish. If thou to be seen, be sloth, by sun or moon thou dark both. You dark both the sun and the moon because you're beautiful. You're more beautiful. And if myself have, uh, have leave to see, I need not their light. I don't need the sun. I don't need the moon because I have thee. Having, having thee. Having you. Let others freeze. Look at this. We don't usually find this in Elizabethan courtly love, which again negates all, removes all negativities and all shortcomings and portray a perfect, a perfect world. Let others freeze with angling greeds and cut their legs, you know, not just like cutting and throwing them away, like, you know, injuring them. And cut their legs, or perhaps cutting their legs. That's really a very unromantic image to be in a love, in a love form. Very different, very different. Their legs with shells and weeds, or treacherous poor fish beset with strangling snare, or windowy net. Let coarse bold hands from slimy rest, nest the bedded fish in banks outrest. Or curious traitors, sleeve silk flies, bewitch poor fishes wandering eyes. I'm very much interested in the last stanza. We'll talk in more detail next class. But I'm very interested in the last stanza here, which is also very different. He takes us, remember Marlowe, Marlowe was saying, come live with me and be my love and then so if these pleasures might they move then come live with come live with me and be my love going to the circularity and we saw how the word ended the line, the poem ended with the first like the first line and the last lines ended in the same word love and love and going in this circle where the poet again i don't know suggesting that uh, poets will always do this will always try to trick women and this is the world that women will will be men will be uh, men as deceitful as they are here. So for thee, thou needs no such deceit. You're smart, you're intellectual, you're intelligent. You don't need deceit. You can't be deceived. It's not easy to deceive you. For thou thyself are thine own bait. And this is where, again, John Donne becomes argumentative and intellectual. If you are the bait, how are you your own bait? Or is he now shifting, saying now you, you are the fish? But you are also the bait. No, the fish are the men. Sorry? The fish are the men. And she is their bait. She is the bait. Or she, but here he's saying, you are your own bait. So you are bait. Here, here he's talking to her here, the woman. For thee, thou needs no such deceit. You don't need the deceit of, you don't need the, you, you can't, like the, 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 the nets or the flies or the, the, the sleeve silk or the... Uh, uh, the hooks, because you are, you for thou thy, you thy, thy uh, thyself are thine own bait. You are enough. You don't need to put on deceitful airs and say yes. deceitful things to catch men. To you are enough to catch men. Okay. You are not. You are not the bait, but you are your own bait. That's the idea. It, you are on yourself. That's, it, it's your choice to, 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 to go to the beat or not. You are enough to yourself and you choose yourself. Okay. So uh, it's like you are more smart than like other people saying that she's the disease and she's the medicine at the same time. Okay. Okay, I like this. So there's yeah. the, the, that you can uh, be you can both things at the same time. Not, not the woman to the woman, 
woman. No, the woman to the shepherd. And that's a very interesting idea also. You because really we'll ask the question, who, who is the active person in the, in the text? The woman. The woman. The woman. Who does more? <coughs> who acts more? The, the woman. And we'll see this very often in John Donne. We'll see how, during, by the way, during his time, uh, John Donne was attacked by contemporary critics. We'll discuss this in detail in the uh, next class. He was trashed. He was actually threatened with death. Somebody said John Donne deserves hanging for breaking the rules of pacification. Somebody said John Donne will perish. And someone said John Donne perplexes the minds of the fair sex. John Donne confuses women. They don't understand him. And unsurprisingly, the speaker is a man telling that women will not be able to understand another man speaking for women, being, appointing himself as a spokesperson for women. So that fish that is not catched thereby, and the finally the conclusion is that, so some fish will be caught by you, the men, in, in, in this elaborate metaphor. But these, uh, 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 like here, I understand that this, that the speaker here, who is the fish in the poem, is caught by the beauty is enchanted by the beauty, is controlled by the beauty of the woman, by the woman. And that fish that is not catched thereby, alas, is wiser far than I. Because I was caught. And those people, that, those fish that uh, managed to run, to, to run away, they are far wiser than me. And again, we, ha we have here a poet, a man, saying, I'm not wise, I'm stupid, I'm not smart. This is new. Poets always market and promote themselves as smart, intellectual, know-it-all, and this kind of thing, which is something we'll discuss in, in more detail uh, later on. Please. Okay. And there's, you know, there's something anti-feminists always say, uh, which is like, don't uh, marry a woman who reads or who thinks or who is smarter than you. Who's smarter than you. Yeah. Like, um, maybe he's saying here that according to the Elizabethan ideals, I sh I shouldn't be ensnared by a woman superior to me because that will make me look bad to other people, bad. to the society. We'll see in more detail. This is a beautiful poem. It's tough sometimes to get around the metaphor, the conceit, and the new ideas. We're not used to this. We're used to the woman being the most beautiful woman in the world, or being, uh, you know, in, uh, seduced by everything beautiful. In Marlowe, the woman, we'll see this later on in your uh, reflections, the, the, the woman is not there. We see, for God's sakes, we see her ship ship, but we don't see her, right? <laughs> She's not there. Right? She's not even in the poem. She's not mentioned. She's not even described. Okay? So, again, we'll focus on the first and the last stanzas. This is, this is Marlowe offering all, all the pleasures. All the pleasures. And this is John Donne. Offering some new pleasures. I'm sure you highlight. Did you notice this in your reflections? You see how good you are? How smart you are? Far wiser than I. Okay? Now what, what I'm saying here is that just by noticing this, because I know many people who just read and meh, it's nothing. It doesn't mean a lot to them. So the first thing when we approach a poem, the first thing to do is to notice things, to read the language. And even last time we noticed that all the pleasures come on. Who are you? With all due respect to shepherds. You're not a king, you don't have everything. You're not a billionaire. And the pleasures. But here then somebody, and John Donne could have written a totally different poem in a totally different way with a totally different opening, by the way. 
But he insists, and this is what I like about John Donne, he is deliberately and consciously telling us that I'm writing against the current, against the mainstream of Elizabethan poetry writing. I'm quoting, many people parodied this poem, uh, Marlowe's poem. But he's saying that I'm doing it, and I'm doing it differently. We, we saw uh, Raleigh. Raleigh was trying to defend, defend women, right? Speaking for women to reply to, to Marlowe. But this is not only a reply to Marlowe. This is a reply to all Elizabethan courtly love poetry. So many things are different here. Not only, thank you, the representation of, of women. The woman is different. The sensibility is different. The language is different. Moving from the idealism of the Elizabethan uh, poetry to the realism of, of, of the metaphysical poetry is something interesting. Now, again, look at this, how, look at how the ending also goes, the last stanza, where there is this insistence like, it says, come back. The opening says, come live with me and be my love, and the ending says, come live with me, then love, live with me and be my love. It's like an authoritarian figure, somebody dominating and just giving orders, where the woman is passive, inactive, she just has to obey. But here, it's a totally different, come live with me and be my love, and then, and then, oh my God, I'm not as smart as I thought. She's smarter than me. She's more powerful, more intellectual uh, than me. Now, with, with John Donne doing this, during the heyday of Renaissance or neoclassical poetry, we'll talk about this again after John Donne, how uh, uh, the rules of decorum were uh, very, very significant at that time. If you wanted to write poetry, you had to follow the rules. And the rules meant that you need to choose uh, sophisticated subject matters. You need to choose subject matters that are elite in nature. Because poetry basically was an elite practice. An elite practice basically written for rich people, for the king, for the elite, for the noble families. Unlike drama, by the way. Drama was more popular than poetry. Because the even poor people could pay, I don't know, a penny or something and go watch even Shakespeare's plays. And poetry, uh, drama meant that the, the king or, you know, the, the, the rich people would be in the same place. But again, seated up above people because they are the rich people. But this is very fantastic because drama is for the people near the stage. Because it's usually those poor people near the stage who would be shouting and uh, you know uh, making fun of actors and Throw probably them throwing them. stuff. And then and then I'm sure that the rich people would be like, oh, what the hell are those people doing? You know, spoiling the fun for us. So poetry was exclusive. Poetry was just for, uh, for, for those people in, 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 in the courts, the palace. So the themes have to reflect the sensibility, the etiquette. It wouldn't be fun to write a poem for the king about a piece of pizza you had, or a fly you killed, or a mouse you trapped. It would be disgusting. The king would be disgusted. So you write about kings and queens of courtly love. You write about God, Adam, and Eve, the queen, and battles, and heroes, and the universe, and epics. For John Donne, no. Anything, any topic can be the subject matter of poetry. For the neoclassicists, we'll see how language has to be highly embellished. <coughs> you don't choose any word, any phrase, any expression to include in your poetry. You have to select, to choose and select, because th that's why we have something called poetic language. Poetic language means language that is suitable for the subject matter, the elite subject matter you already choose. And then you have to follow the rules, the regulations, the, 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 the same uh, number of syllables, the same number, the same regular rhyme scheme. Now, John Donne said no to all of this. I could follow the rules, but if the rule contradicts the idea, limits my feeling, my thought, he would disregard the rule altogether. He would break, willingly and happily break the rule. Because the meaning for John Donne is more significant than the rule. And that's key to John Donne. Meaning comes first. He would break the rule willingly 
in order to accommodate his, his thoughts, his feelings, his ideas. Now in brief, he was not appreciated during his, tif his lifetime. Yes. Naturally, he wouldn't be appreciated. Some people link this to, I don't think it's just that, like many people are extreme. If they believe in something, it's their own way or no way. So poetry had to follow these rules, these strict rules. And some of those people, some of those critics were really extreme in their following and calling for these rules. But also, it's partly about the money. Poets had patrons, people who paid them money in order to, to write. So if, if there is a new poet in town saying, no, 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 there is another way poetry can be written a different way, probably he will be attracting many patrons. Probably they're going to lose support or something. But again, it's not basically about this. When people believe in ideas, it's more, you know, this belief, this dogma and something. Sometimes it's more extreme than the money. It's not only about the money. So basically, people, uh, critics uh, uh, who were living, some of them were friends to John Donne. They, like uh, Ben Johnson, we'll talk about this in detail, uh, inshallah, next class. Uh, ben Johnson said, uh, Shakespeare, uh, sorry, John Donne will perish for not following the rules of poetry. He will perish, he will be forgotten. And Ben Johnson said, John Donne deserves hanging. Yeah, deserves hanging. For what? For breaking the rules. And I know some, some people take this lightly. That doesn't mean much, but it is a serious threat. And finally, they were termed by, uh, by Dryden and by Samuel Johnson as metaphysical poets. So in, in, even in your book, I, I have this uh, subtitle saying the metaphysical poets. But what does it mean? What is metaphysical? What does it mean? Who called them and why, why do we still use metaphysical uh, uh, poetry? Are they metaphysical? Did they call themselves? Metaphysicals. We'll see this next class. We'll talk about this, discuss this in more detail. Uh, John Donne, features, sensibility, rules or no rules, rules of decorum, John Donne's contemporaries and critics. We'll go back to this poem, this beautiful poem, The Bait, and also please try to have a look at this poem by, by John Donne. Good luck and see you soon.